So further on from my drumming for programmers, a little insight into things like the 8-beat. I'm going to sample this entire drum kit so that it can all be played back on a keyboard or programmed. Now I happen to really like this kit. It's just a little sort of small jazzy kit with some nice sort of selection of cymbals. And, you know, it's nice to have more drum sounds rather than just the ones you can buy. Now, I've got at the moment a mic in front of the kick drum. I've got these two over the overhead, which are a sort of an XY pair, which is basically capturing a sort of stereo image of everything and capturing ambience. And I've got this other mic over here, which I'm going to use as a mic that just I use to mic the tom, play the toms individually, and the snare and the hi-hats, and to a certain extent the cymbals. The reason I say that is the cymbals are kind of, they're so spacey in terms of their stereo image that you'll get most of what you need from the overheads. So I'm going to record, I'm going to try and record as many samples as I can of each drum. Any mistakes I make, I will say something so that when I come to play them back, I get a visual record of any problems. So here's the bass drum. Oh, okay, second sample. That was a good start, wasn't it? I'll tell you what, I'm going to start all that again. Now, what I have to do is I have to wait for the ambience to sort of die down before I do the next sample so that you get the full ambience with no, no encumbrance there. So here we go, first bass drum again. Okay, six samples should be enough for my purposes so that I, you can get the sort of, you can get those sort of, uh, you know, sort of quiet and loud sort of rhythms. Snare drum. Now, I've got this mic here, which I'm just going to bring round. I should also point out, of course, that before you begin, you need to sound check your mics to make sure that the loudest sample that you're playing is the loudest possible recording level so that when you get down to your quiet samples you don't get lots of noise when you're trying to hear what's going on. So I'm just going to briefly check my uh, snare drum. You can see five tracks recording on your screen there. Um, the bottom one is the narration mic uh, which is picking up the drums as well but obviously I'll notch that out when I produce the video. The top one is the bass drum and the second one is the snare. Notice that it's also coming out over the overheads and my narration mic. So I'm going to do the snare drum now. Now, ideally, you would record right and left hand because if you're playing a fill on the snare drum, uh, my rudiments are nowhere, but you get slightly different sounds because of where you are on the kit. So I'm going to record 12 of the, well, let's, let's see how many samples it ends up being. It might be eight, maybe. But the more you can get on the snare, the more realistic you can get with rolls and sort of, you know, other things and flams. So here we go. Okay, so I've got 12 of those. Now, with the other hand, I've got my keyboard in the way here, I'm going to try and play a little bit further over this way uh, with the mic in the same place and try not to hit the mic. So, 12 of those. I'll move round slightly. So, here we go.
Okay, so the gradation in levels on that left hand wasn't as controlled as the right hand. I'm right-handed. You know, that, that might make a difference. It might make it more realistic when I come to play it back. But I have to check individual levels of each thing. So, also on the snare drum, we have cross stick. We also have things like rim shot. So I might record a couple of those as well. So here's the um, stick, um, the cross stick first. So I'm not particularly worried about getting 12 of those. That is in, you know, ding, 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 ding. That should be enough to have four of those. So uh, things like um, flams, when you do one stick and then the next one, the, the other one rather, uh, very shortly afterwards. They're too close together. So flams is more like like that. Now you could program this using the snare sound, but I'll record a couple just so I've got them there. That'll do. Now, rim shots. The idea is to hit the snare and the side, the, the drum and the side of the rim at the same time. And I'm going to try this. I'm not very good at this. That'll do. <laughs> I'll be here all day trying to get graded um, rim shots. Now, that's about it from a snare drum. I mean, you can do so many things. You can do snare rolls or you can do a, you know, a very quick triplet or whatever, but you, to a certain extent, you can program these things on the fly. So next up, hi-hat. Now this is the one of the most used in, in addition to the kick and the snare and the hi-hat. They are the things that you will be on the most. So hi-hat, what I've got here is my mic which I'm just going to raise a little bit further over the hi-hat so I get a nice balanced view of the cymbal sonically. I'm going to do some shoulder hits and then some tip like that and I'm also going to record closed hi-hat, half open and then sort of fully open. It's hard to get the consistency of these sounds, but I'm going to do my best. So here is the closed hi-hat samples. That should be enough. And now the stick samples. So I'll do that again. Stick samples, so loudly. So now the half open ones. So what I've got to do is to try and, um, what you can do actually, is if you, if you close the hi-hat, you won't have to hold your foot in the same place. So here is the half open ones, shoulder. Half open stick. And then the fully open ones. Now, with these, hi-hat, you only get one sound at once. If I was to do the open hi-hat, it'll be followed by a closed hi-hat, which is 
another sound that I've got to sample. Ideally, when you put all these sounds in your sampler, you'll only have one sound at once. Now, here's the uh, open hi-hat then. The honest answer is, I don't know what that's gonna sound like, because the first one was quite open like that. But I'm just gonna carry on, because for the purposes of this demonstration, I mean, you can see basically what's happening already anyway with, the, with what I'm doing, the procedure. And the, it's very important with the procedure to make sure that you're really consistent, um, because if you get lots and lots of different noises, it's not ideal. Now, the toms. Yeah, quick sound check, they're all right. Okay, so I'm just going to aim the mic towards here. So I'm going to get maybe four samples here. Now this one and the snare are very close together. So while I'd want snare rattle, maybe I'll just hold the tom slightly, you know, hold the snare slightly to stop it rattling so much. So here is the high tom. One of the reasons I took six there was because I've taken six of everything else, those hi-hats. And actually, when it comes to dividing the files up, it's a bit more consistent. Now, low tom. Let's move the mic over here. Now, all, of the, all the time, the ambient mics here are picking up not only the ambience, but also the positions of the drums in the stereo spectrum, which is what you want to try and maintain when you are playing them back. You want to have that nice sort of stereo effect where there's quite a lot going on. Um, but every drum has its place. You know, we're recording essentially one instrument, but lots of parts of it. So here is the, um, the rack, the, sorry, the low tom. Now that symbol, the ride symbol is moving a bit, so I'm actually gonna hold it while I do the, the uh, low tom. So I'm gonna aim for six of these as well. Now I've got eight there because actually the first two were very similar in level and I don't want that. So cymbals now. The, I've got the crash cymbal, I've got a, a really nice Bosphorus crash which sounds great as a, like a crash ride sort of real sort of trashy sort of ride cymbal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the, the direct mic up against it for the sake of consistency with my sampling, but it doesn't mean that I have to use them because ideally the cymbals should be in stereo. Um, I've never understood uh, mono cymbal samples. I don't get it um, because that's not the point. A cymbal is meant to wash around your stereo image. Um, it's just, I suppose, it's just cheaper to, to do it. So I'm gonna ho hold the, the mic here above the axis of the cymbal because you get a lot of bass end at the fringes. So a crash cymbal is usually played on the edge here with the shoulder of the stick. Never play a crash cymbal with the shoulder of the stick on the middle because you'll crack it, you'll stick a crack in it easily. So I'm gonna do some uh, shoulder and then some, some quieter ones on the, um, on the stick and I'll put these in different places on the keyboard.
Now there's four of those. You may know, I grabbed the symbol towards the end of each or just brought my hand up to it. Simply just to, so because the sample could be on 30 seconds long and there's not really any point in that. At the end of every, you know, at the end of lots of records when the crash symbols hit, the gradually the, the sound is sort of muted or rather faded as a sort of automated thing anyway. So I'm not gonna lose sleep over that. Now, I'm gonna do some uh, stick symbols as well. Um, so I can get some sort of different sounds out of it. Symbol is so multi-capable. So here we go. So while I'm here, I'm also going to do some sort of the bell symbols. So here we go. Okay, there are four things there of each, of each sort of sound. The, the reality is you can, you can get so many sounds out of a crash cymbal, but really it's, you know, we, we, you know you, you've got to sort of try and draw the line somewhere with it. So now I'm gonna move the um, mic over to the right cymbal. Now I've gotta be a little bit more careful with this, because there's quite a lot of build on a ride cymbal, which is something you cannot sample. Um, because the, the build of a ride cymbal is part of, it's part of its characteristic, which is why a ride cymbal so, suddenly can sound a bit false. But I'm gonna do the same thing on here. Now the ride cymbal is gonna be longer than that as a sample. So we've really, it's just all about patience. I mean, this video is now 18 minutes and 30 something seconds long. You know, it's going to be a bit longer than that when you come to edit, believe me. So here is the ride symbol. So what I've got to do is to sort of find out where the good sort of, where a really nice balanced sound of this symbol is, because I could play this. There's so many different places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to aim for sort of the middle of the symbol and I'm going to do some tips and then I'm going to do a couple of the shoulder ones. So here's the tip ride symbol. I recorded six there because the ride symbol is, if you're not on the hi-hat, you're gonna be doing quite a lot on the ride symbol. So the more samples I can gain, the more samples I can get, the better. So I'm gonna do a couple of, um, the, of the, the shoulder ones, but maybe I'll do four of those instead.
and now for some bell sounds. So I'm going to do maybe some shoulder and tip sounds here. Okay, there's me four shoulder sounds, and I'm going to get a couple of tip sounds as well. Right, so 21 minutes odd in, I've got all my samples. So the next thing I have to do is I have to get really mega, mega strict with my file naming and hierarchy because when you import them into the sampler, the sampler needs to know things like the notes you're going to put them on. And I know that because I use, I've got Logic 7 here, and here we are in 2018. Logic 7 came out in 2004. But it works for me and I just keep using it and it's fine, it's 24 bit, it'll do any sample rate. I've got a nice sound card attached to it. So hopefully we're, get, we're in business. So the next part of the video is the editing and I'm going to edit one of the instruments just to show you how it works, but you won't have to sit through another three days of uh, me yapping on. So for the next part of this, I've got all my drum samples. My next job is to try and get all of these things, all of these drums into some sort of hierarchy so that I can start programming my sampler. So if we look at the top channel, you can see a gradual overview, uh, general overview of everything that I've done. So the narration mic's at the bottom and you can see all the drums being recorded mostly with the AKG mic on the drums with the overheads on all the time. The first one is my bass drum, which I'm going to do first. So I'm going to zoom in on those and you can see, if I just artificially zoom in so you can see the waveforms, I've got my six kick drums there. There we go. So I've got the six kick drums on the main mic and then the two stereo ones, which you can see here. So my first job is to just isolate the sort of kick drum take, if you like. So I'm going to uh, just cut all three tracks in the same place. There we go. Something like that. And go to the very end and somewhere around about there. So my first job with this one, this is the kick drum direct mic is I'm going to go and find something called strip silence. Now what this does is it automatically edits out, you can see there you've got my six drums now, but it's, go it's only recording, it's only going to allow me to get a very tiny snapshot of that, unless of course I actually decrease the threshold and increase the silence level. Now I want to do this because I need to have drums that don't suddenly cut out. So I'm going to click OK on that and I've now got six regions here. Now my first job is just to put a little fade at the end of each one so that we don't get a sudden drop off in level. Now as it gets quieter the fade can be a bit longer because otherwise you run the risk of getting lots and lots of noise where the uh, level is obviously lower, allowing more of the noise to come in. So if we just listen very, very briefly to that first kick drum, it's now got a very quick, uh, clean fade on it. There we go. So 
the next thing is to split the is to do the overheads in the same way now we've got to be a little bit careful here because the overheads are in stereo really what I should have done was to combine these two as a stereo file which I could still do uh, if I was gonna I could bounce it as a stereo file and re-import and then do the strip silence like that but now I'm here I'm just going to do it this this way just to just so that you can see uh, what's happening so at the moment it's not actually capturing a huge amount of what I want partly because I've actually selected everything so if I go strip silence on that we should see our six things now because the overhead is quieter than the the drum itself I've got a little bit of a problem here I can only see three samples here so I'm gonna have to do some of these actually uh, sort of um, uh, by hand as it were so I'm going to have to find the well I can do the the main uh, main ones if I just edit out number four there we go so I'm going to do the strip silence on these and I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to do both tracks simultaneously although that one looks louder perhaps the uh, the ambience was a bit louder on one side I've got to watch that actually because uh, there could be a difference in level. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the mixer up and just double check that two and three, which are my, sorry, three and four, that's the reason why it's not working, because I'm actually looking at the snare drum channel. Now, there is so many pitfalls here. There's so many ways of getting things very wrong. So me yapping through while I'm doing it is possibly both a hindrance and a benefit. So I'm going to just... Do the strip silence here now we've got five things i'll tell you what that's going to have to do and five things here there we go what i could do is i could extend the fifth one or i could bring i could extend these two tracks back to actually find the sixth one manually because it would be it would be advantageous for me to have this and I can use the direct signal level at the top to find roughly where I'm going to have these samples there we go I'm gonna have a go at that let's have a look now one reason for doing it this way is that we end up also sampling exactly the same length sound on both channels both the overheads and oh I accidentally grabbed both of them and the overheads and the direct mic so if we take these precautions with every other drum sound that we're going to do then we're in business so we've got to make sure that this one these start at the same place as well and they don't at the moment so I'm going to just move those in a little bit just put the cursor over there this one as well so preparing your samples ready for importing into your sampler is actually a better idea than trying to edit things when you're within it because you're doing everything right the first time so my bass drum samples are going to end up being something like this I've got six things there six things at the top so I'm going to export this one now this is where your file hierarchy really needs to be absolutely tip top. So kick direct one. Now I'm going to save that in a new folder on the desktop called Gretsch. Can't spell Gretsch. There we go. Gretsch kit. Inside Gretsch kit, I'm going to create a new folder called kick there we go and then inside kick drum I'm going to save kick direct one this is laborious but believe me it's worth it in the end so kick direct two etc 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 direct three now once you've done all these, once you've um, exported all these, we need to do something slightly different with the overheads in that they need to be what's called, they need to be bounced. Kick direct five. 
Now, if I'd recorded the overheads as a stereo pair, it would have been slightly easier to do this. But actually, you do get problems uh, with uh, sometimes with the stereo balance or if the phasing's not quite right or anything like that. So actually, the way I've done it is, in a way, not too bad. It's, it's OK as a, as a sort of result. Now, I need to just make that the same, roughly the same there. Uh, and I need to put fades on the stereo ones as well. Now, I'm not going to lose too much sleep over this. I'm just going to put a fade at the end, right at the end, rather than fading a little bit uh, too early. But I need to make sure that my left and right are the same. If in doubt, have them longer. We live in an era now where computer memory is so much more uh, able to uh, sort of store all this stuff and play it back. Even a 12-year-old laptop like this, which is, works the same day as when I got it out of the box, it's never seen the internet. Um, it's basically, um, it's able to sort of ca capture all of those things and play them all back with very few problems. So I'm just going to make sure that my that kick drum sample is right. So I'm zooming to quite a high level here. Um, in fact, I'm going to do this so I can uh, zoom in horizontally, uh, vertically, but not um, or horizontally, but not vertically. So I'm just going to check that that is the same there, and then I'll do this. So I'm going to end this part of the video in just a second because this essentially I have to do for every other drum that I've sampled. That's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Really is worth it because what, what you get is something that sounds very, very realistic. And if you really pernickety over this and you get everything absolutely spot on, there's nothing to stop you selling these. You know, you can sell somebody a, a, a package of drum sounds, you know, it's fine, you do that. So there are my kick drums now. Now I've got to edit out the end of the sixth one. If you remember, I uh, couldn't find that on strip silence. So I'm just gonna make it roughly the same length as the others. Um, just bring that out of the way there and I'm going to put a fade at the end of those two as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bounce the stereo files together by selecting one of them and if I click and I, make, I have to make sure that these are soloed. So when I bounce it'll take every single audio file unless you mute so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute that, and I'm going to mute those, and I'm going to mute that. So this is just leaving channels three and four as going to be my uh, ambient mics. So select that again, go to bounce. It will automatically find the places that I need to start and finish the bounce because of that selection that I made. So kick ambient oh, amb one. So I need to find my uh, most recent folder, kick. There we go. So it's got my kick directs one to six. I'm going to stick the ambient ones with it as well. Now at this stage, you could decide to put the note MIDI note in, which I'm going to specify because when you bring it into the sampler, it's more likely to put it in the right place automatically. So ideally I should do that with kick direct one and to six, but I can rename those in my file search on the computer. Kick one, ambient one, C1. There we go. Um, yeah, C1. And I'm going to do those. Kick amb two, C1. So I've just decided on the numbers one to six as in one is the loudest, six is the softest. So there we go, done that. Kick amb three. I'm going to make sure I keep my capital letters. I know this is really pernickety, but actually it can be a real chore if you're looking for a file and you can't find it because somebody's changed the, uh, the upper or lower case. I know it sounds really, really sad, this. And yes, I should perhaps get out to the pub a bit more, but you see what I mean. So kick amb five C1. Uh, there we go, and kick ambient 6, C1. And there we go. Now I've done that, I'm going to open up my sampler that I've got here, and I'm going to go into the edit window, and I'm going to go new instrument. 
There we go. What I can do, also do is save it as something while I'm here. So this is going to be Gretsch. and it saves it in the sampler instruments in Logic. Now what I need to do is I need to load multiple samples. Oh, there we go. Ideally, I'd do this after I've done everything, but I'm just going to show it to you on this, because the next thing, part of the video you will see, will be every single drum loaded in to the uh, sampler, and then you can hear how good it sounds. So, I'm going to import all of those. Add done. Drums, zone without range, root key from audio file. Now, if I've got this right, yeah, there we go, it's put some of them at C3 and some of them at C1. Because I told it to put things at C1, it means that they'll all be in the right place by default. But I need to move those. I need to zoom in on this to be able to grab all of those. I need to move all of those to C1, which I'm going to do now. There we go. Now they're all in place, we've got a group that it's also put automatically, and I'm going to call that group Kick Direct. Mm, maybe just Kick actually, because I don't. I only need to differentiate between Kick and Kick Ambient. Maybe I could do could save myself a bit of file hierarchy by doing that as well. But actually, if you can see a sample that says Ambient or Direct, maybe it's easy, it is easier to find it. So. Zone number one, kick ambient c1.wav. I need to put that into kick ambient group. So I can do all my grouping to start with. Kick ambient. Kick ambient. Kick ambient. So I'm going to finish this portion of the video simply by, dis by making sure that all of these drums are going to work together on one key on my keyboard. And then the next bit of the video is everything there. So kick direct one is, is in its right place now in terms of its grouping. Now, just taking one of these zones here, or which is basically a sample, I need to disable the pitch so that I don't hear the drum at any pitch other than the one that I recorded it at. I need to select range. Now that what that is, is on the keyboard, when you hit the key, you get a note value or volume from 0 to 127. So I need kick ambient C1, the loudest one, to perhaps only be at the very top end of my range. So I'm going to say 125 to 127, which means that my second drum, I need to have as something below 124. So that essentially all the ranges, all the volumes of the piano, uh, on the piano keyboard, line up with one sample on your drums. So I'm going to say 115 to 124 for that next one. So that will be uh, 114 as my maximum, maybe to 100. And then I need to do that for the other ones as well. So maybe 99 is my top figure, 70. Now, this is an old version of Logic. The newer versions of Logic have got a much, much more slick operating system than this. But of course, this computer is too old for even Logic 8. So I'm not gonna worry too much. So now I'm getting down into the lower ones, 40 to 69. And then my quiet, quietest sample, I might have at 39 anywhere between 0 and 39. Now, when you come to program this, when you come to program the sounds, you can actually set something as a loop and then change the volume level of each sample to be even more realistic than it was before. So now, when I go to this, um, I will have something like this. If I um, play back my sample, I need to actually go out of this. I need to save this. There we go. I need to exit that, go back into the sampler, and then call up Gretsch Kit. You see everything else I've done before. So now, now that's that is too low for me. 
So one of these samples, I haven't actually done the um, disable pitch facility. Disable pitch is there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. Ah, now what I haven't done is the rest of the samples, actually. So I'm going to actually uh, turn down the group kick so that we're only listening to the kick ambient at the moment. Now, if you can't hear anything, as I can't hear at the moment, we may have a problem with our samples. Now, the best way to do this is to go into your finder. If you can't hear anything on your sampler, first double check that the sample that you've actually got has actually been recorded. So, I need to find whether my kick ambient one has actually recorded. Now, I'm struggling to hear that. Now, that means there's a problem with my exporting my audio file. Now, I'm going to just try that once again on Kick Ambient C1. Now, this was the bounce that I did. I'll just double check this. This is worth doing from the beginning because you can do all of your samples and then end up with a right old nightmare because nothing is working. We don't certainly don't want that. Okay, my kick direct are working. But for some reason, my ambient mics are not. Now, that could be down to a number of reasons. There could be, I'm just going to try that again. So, just make sure that it plays back on logic. OK, I can hear that. So what I need to do is to mute that, mute the other channels and just leaving these ones. And I'm going to try bouncing that again. Kick ambient C1. I can just overwrite what was there. So I've just got to double check that it is doing it from the right place. 53, yeah. Replace. Now I'm going to go into Finder and just double check that that file is there. I have experienced this as a problem before, so that's kind of the reason why I was um, sort of going through this procedure. Right, for some reason, I can now hear that. So my best bet is simply to go through again. I might, may have muted this channel or soloed one of the other channels by mistake, and you can really come unstuck if, you, um, if, you, if that happens. So I'm just going to very briefly... Um, just do all those again while I'm here. Always do something while you're, while you're in place, while you're in a certain place, just to make sure that your file hierarchy is going to essentially survive the test of time. So, replace. Okay. Um. Right. Yeah, that is number four. Then it, it's it really does pay to absolutely check that things are going to that things are going to work. So file is busy. One or more files are open. It could be that I've got. I need to refresh the finder. Or you can, if you get problems with that, you can just say, okay, well, I'm going to save it as something slightly different, and you just have to make a note of it. So kick amb. Ambi for C1. <laughs> there we go. Now it may do this on the other one, I don't know. Let's have a look. No, it's done it there. So kick Ambi 4 is the only one that I couldn't... Um, it's the only one that I had to call a different name. Unless this one does it as well. No, that's fine. Next job is to go into Finder and actually make sure that you delete anything that is... Well, so kick amb4 was fine. Kick amb4 I want to get rid of. And then I want to rename this one kick amb4. 
The, one of the reasons for this is that the sample that you've just the sampler that you've just uh, opened will still contain those samples. It will be addressing the correct samples, even if you've had to record them again and overwrite them in your finder. There we go. So uh, edit, and then hopefully my samples. Let's turn that one back up so we've got the kick direct and make sure those are working. Okay, and kick ambient. So you may need to go back into here and actually reload it in. There we go. Another way of checking is if you go into the edit window, you can see it's actually there. So you can see it's brought it in. Now, at this point, you can see from the edit window that the bass drum, there's a bit of silence beforehand. We don't want that. So you're going to have to do this with all of your samples as well. You're going to have to essentially bring the cursor up until the sample starts, making sure that you also have something called search zero crossings in place. And what that is, is you essentially, when you, um, when you search for, um, when, you, when you're editing, you need to make sure that your zero crossings thing is actually ticked. There we go, there it is. Search zero crossings. So you may have to just tweak that, just bring it back forwards, there we go, that's fine. So now that sample is gonna play back. There endeth the second part of this sampling video. Now I've just got lots of legwork to do. The next time you see this, you'll be able to hear the whole drum kit on a keyboard. So you join me for the final, the last waltz of the drum sampling trilogy. Now I've got all of my samples on here. I have 224 samples, so that's 112 sounds because I've got a direct and an ambient of each. So that might seem like a lot of samples, but actually there are drum sampling sort of things out there that have far more samples than that. This is really the principle of it, um, and basic in some areas and more extensive in others. So I've now got all my drum sounds organized via uh, the EXS24 in Logic, but whatever sampler you use, the principle is exactly the same. So I've got kick drum, got all sorts of sounds there. I've mixed the ambient and the direct signal. So if I take the direct signal away, all you can hear now is the ambient sound. This is much more pronounced if you've got headphones on. I would recommend uh, headphones for, for this part of the demo because you can hear things like the, the fact that we've got stereo cymbal samples. Um, I don't understand, I've never understood mono cymbal samples which some drum sounds have on them. I don't get that because cymbals are a stereo thing. They you know, they have to wash over the kit. So there's the kick drum. Next up, we've got the snare, left hand, and then snare right hand on E. If I can play that properly. And then on D sharp, I've got the, the flat, the sort of crossed um, rim shot. On C sharp, I've got my cross stick. So I've got all my snare drum stuff down here. Now I've got hi hats on the next one, the shoulder hats and the stick hats, so that you can create an eight beat that sounds a little bit more drivey if you use those two sounds instead of this. Now the hi hats, I'm pretty sure I recorded six of each. I should have gone a little bit further than that. Ideally, I had 12 samples on the snare drum. I should have done 12 hi-hats so that it didn't, because it, otherwise it can sound very similar. And the way that a drummer plays the hi-hats imparts more variation perhaps than the snare drum. So the next pair of uh, keys that I've got is uh, the half open hat samples that I had, so shoulder and stick.
So I do have that variation there. So next up, we've got the open hi-hat. Now, if you remember, I recorded that sample. It's still going. And there we go. Now it's closed. Now, the way I've grouped the hi-hats here is I've got only one sample that can be played at once. If I just look at this, um, hats ambient, that'll do. So one voice maximum. So you can see the voices number, you can only have one voice on here. And the same for hats direct, one voice. Note that I've got two, still got two sounds because I've got the ambient sound and a direct sound. That means if I play another hi-hat sample, it will cancel out that open one. Like that. That's not incredibly realistic, so I sampled the pedal hat as well. Now, in the first part of the video, I forgot to actually do the proper closed hat samples, but luckily there were enough on that soundtrack that I managed to lift one or two. So luckily, uh, yeah, I was obviously just talking too much. I'm good at that. Now, of course, the way that the, those two sounds interact makes that sound slightly unrealistic. It's okay, but we've got, that's the sort of thing to sort out with the programming. And in fact, it sounds better with the louder sample. It depends what you're doing. See, the fact that, the, that you've got one sample at once Actually, what's happening there, the shoulder is much louder than the stick. But it's okay. We're doing this. The reason I'm doing this, apart from to show you the principles of how it works, is that you can sit there and program with some nice stereo ambient drum sounds. You can sit there on the train and do it. Now, of course, this is, there is no substitute to having a real drummer on your record. He or she will impart all sorts of things that you might not have even thought of. So this is just something that you can use to make something sound pretty good, but not the finished product as it were. So I've got other things. I've got the toms on A and B. So A is my low tom. And B, my high tom. I accidentally struck C there, which is actually the stick sound of my crash cymbal. Shoulder crash cymbal is on C sharp. Quite nice to have those two variations of crash, crash cymbal, because otherwise it's the same sound. Of course, I graded those with velocity as well, so ride cymbal. Now, every time I hit that key, the sampler is having to replay that same sound, or rather playing the sound while the other one is still playing. So you've got to make sure that the number of voices on your sampler is set very high. Uh, there's always a trade-off between the number of samples you can play back at once and the amount of RAM you have in your computer. That there is the bell of the crash cymbal. You can hear that they're the same pitch there, the same diameter symbol. And there's the ride bell. Now we've got here the ride shoulder as well. Got a ride bell with the shoulder, ride bell with the stick. So I've actually got four different ride cymbal sounds and three different crash ones. So there should be enough there to make that sort of variation, you know, obvious. Um, the hi-hats I should have done a little bit more work on. However, I'm going to show you just briefly how I've done this in terms of grading these samples with velocity. If we just look at the 
Um, let's look at something like the, um, yeah, the, the high tom, for example. So I find my row of samples, which are these six here that I've just highlighted around there. So we've got tom, high tom ambient. We've got six samples. So if I open up the top one, it's called high tom ambient one, which is the loudest one. So if I just open that up, you can see here that we've got two velocity figures here, which is essentially the, the range of velocity that you that, that sample will play. So one to five, one two five to one two seven. That's the t the three loudest sounds that you can get on your um, MIDI range. So there's my high tom ambient one. If I were to hit the key slightly lower, 112 there. I'm going to be playing the next sample down, which is actually it's the sample below that because the next sample down is 115 to 124. Then the next sample down will be will have a 114 upper limit and 100 lower limit. So you've got you've got stages at which you play uh, which those sounds play. However, it's not just the six volume levels here because within each the sampler will play the sample slightly quieter, so you actually are getting 127 different levels of sound, but across six samples. So it's really clever and hugely powerful. So once again with the, um, with the, 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 the toms, I've got an ambient sound. So high tom ambient. If I take it away, I just get the, the direct sound which is just capturing the top skin. Whereas with the ambient sound as well, it's hearing the drum. Now with the drums, you can record, especially with snare drum, and this happens live a lot, is you would have a mic on the, the top of the snare and a mic on the bottom of the snare so that you are recording the box as it were. Uh, you can do that with your samples. You can even have snare top, snare under and be able to mix those. So you end up with, not 12 samples per key or 24 as I've got here, but you might end up with 48 samples on one single key that you can then mix. How long is a piece of string is really the sort of essence of this. So there are my samples. You can see the, um, the pedal hats right on the left, which is A0, all the way to F sharp at the top, which is the sort of stick bell of my ride symbol. So I've got all of these samples here and I can either play them in or I can program them in. So I think that's about it really. The principles are all there. Everything that's, all the drum sounds that I've, all the samples are assigned to groups so that I'm able to control the levels of each drum. So kick, snare right, snare left, cross stick, rim shot. I might actually, uh, assign all of the snare sounds once they're mixed to a single snare control because the snare drum, things like the flams, or oh, I haven't done the flam, but the cross stick and the rim shot and those four sounds together, ideally if you change the level of your snare, they would all rise and fall by the same amount. But that's the sort of thing, it's very easy to regroup things. Um, each sample here, uh, in addition to the uh, volume, the, the volume limits, also has a group assignment. Um, you can change the pitch of some of these. Let's say I want to change the pitch of my snare. Let's say the snare is a little bit too, well, it's quite deep actually. Um, let's say I wanted to raise that. Now, I'd have to do that with all of my samples by the same amount. That's all right. Maybe you could have it deeper. So that's another advantage of sampling is that you can say, well, I'm gonna change the pitch of some of these drums just to make it sound a bit darker. The bass drum here is only an 18 inch kick drum. So um, the bass drum I've actually tuned down by three semitones. So if the original pitch, for some reason that hasn't changed. Ah, it's because I didn't uh, change my kick ambient as well. That's right. So I had two, two notes playing at once. So if I do that now, that is now. 
But this is a feature of the very first samplers. You could change the pitch of anything. Mega, mega useful. It means you could sample one piano key, say C, use the same note for three other samples to save time and money. So you can do that with your drums. You could change the pitch of your cymbals slightly. Beware of pitch of large pitch changes because it does make that sound a little bit weird and a little bit unrealistic. But, you know, we're in a brave new world of electronic music where anything is possible. And, you know, if you use something in a creative way, it'll always work. So there we go. Drum sampling a complete process.